My Lords, it's a pleasure to speak at the end of such fascinating, interesting and important debate. Uh, I imagine we've all heard things, uh, personal experiences, reflections, arguments that have made us think harder about our own assumptions in this complex area. Uh, I certainly have. Uh, but I'm afraid nothing has shaken my basic view that this is a bad, poorly written bill, uh, which, it, if, if it ever became law, would have a number of rather damaging consequences. I've certainly not been persuaded by anything I've heard that there's a genuine problem with violent or coercive conversion therapy in this country. These things are, after all, already illegal. What worries me is that the effects of this bill would be, as we've heard from many noble lords, to criminalise a much broader range of actions and interactions. And the consequence of that, and maybe this is one of the underlying purposes of the bill, would be to reinforce a tendency towards control and conformity that's already very evident in our society. And that's what worries me. And this bill does it, I think, in three particular ways. First of all, it begins the process of giving legislative force to the controversial view that simply hearing opinions that you don't agree with uh, can in itself cause harm and should therefore be made illegal. Now, this is a damaging proposition anywhere, but it's particularly harmful in this particular area, where individuals differ, where we, as we've heard, there's far from societal or expert consensus, and thus where free debate and discussion is vital if we're going to find the right solutions. Now, a free society works on the opposite principle to that. It works on the principle that everyone has the right to reach their own judgments and opinions, and equally as every adult has the right to ignore such judgment and opinions and do what they want within the law. Now, once we question that principle, as this bill begins to do, we are changing the nature of society. We're asking the state to be our parent, to protect us from uncomfortable concepts and challenging ideas. Now, of course, the only way the state can do that effectively is to define which opinions are acceptable and which aren't, and that leads to the second problem. That second problem is that this bill is another step towards, in practice, creating a state ideology of approved and unapproved ideas. After all, without such an ideology, how do you know which opinions can be safely expressed and which can't? In fact, we've already gone some way down that road. It's not possible to hold certain jobs in the public sector without signing up to, or at least not publicly dissenting from, a set of controversial beliefs about diversity and inclusion. This bill would take it further into wider society. It would make it illegal for religious leaders with their flock, parents with their children, psychologists or psychiatrists with their patients to express some of their profoundest beliefs or even to broach certain ideas. Indeed, in some cases, such people would seemingly be required by the bill to actively say things they don't believe in order to avoid prosecution. Now, that's obviously a problem in itself. But it's, it's also a problem, and it seems to me this is the third way the bill shapes society more broadly. It's a problem because in modern conditions, such a state ideology will inevitably be aggressively secular. Not just neutral, as between different belief systems, which is what many of us think of as secular, but rather one that requires conformity to a particular set of propositions, not propositions shaped by traditional values or beliefs or an established philosophical code, but propositions defined by opposition to those things, and in which there's no room for such beliefs. That's what this bill represents, and it's why it's another step towards pushing religious beliefs out of mainstream debate. And if it's not slowed, before long we're going to find that religious beliefs may be held in private, may occasionally be referred to in public like a dark and shameful secret, but may never be actively brought into the public or professional square. And when we reach that point, which is not far off perhaps, if you believe God created men and women in male and female bodies, better keep it to yourself because the state may think differently. Yeah, yeah. Now, to conclude, I'm sure... Some noble lords will listen to my remarks and think I'm simply exaggerating. Uh, how, they may be saying to themselves, how do you get from a bill that purports to be about treating everybody decently and fairly to this nightmare vision of state-controlled speech? Well, I say, in answer to that, it's precisely in these liminal areas, these border areas, these marginal cases, that new directions get set. 
Of course, everybody, every human being, needs to be treated decently and fairly, because everybody has intrinsic value. But the catch comes when we, come, when we go on to identify that fair, that decent treatment as necessitating that no one should ever hear anything challenging to the beliefs they hold, even if they've chosen to hear that. We can't ensure that in a free society, and trying to do it takes us down a very difficult road. The only thing we can reliably ensure is the right to disagree, the right to stop listening, the right to walk away. But we have that right already. Don't let's start taking it away. Let's reject this bill. Yeah. Yeah.